Welcome to Kids Considered, where two pediatricians discuss children's health topics of interest to parents in a podcast with new subjects considered every episode. I'm Dr. Lena Vanderlist. And I'm Dr. Dean Blumberg. And we're both pediatricians at UC Davis Children's Hospital in Sacramento, California. We are back for part two of our discussion with Dr. Makai Owen about racism and how to best talk to our children about racism. In the last episode, we discussed a lot about structural as well as individual racism and how we can work to improve child health outcomes of kids that are experiencing racism as well as some of the health disparities that we see in kids who have experienced racism throughout their life. Today we're going to be talking about more including how we can talk to our children and how to approach policies that will change an underlying um, racist structure in many institutions. I'd I'd like to talk about kids in terms of talking to kids about racism. And so what can we tell parents when they say, how can I talk with my child um, about this issue? There's a um, book, How to Raise an Anti, How to Be an Anti-Racist, that then um, has been spun off. And so into a children's book, like how to like raise a child to be an anti-racist. I mean, what can parents do in this area? Yeah, I think. It is, of course, dependent on age, um, but we know that so much of brain development and so much of that foundation of a child's life occurs in the first, you know, five years. And I think there, you know, there are studies that show that, you know, babies can can notice race-based differences at a very young age, um, but they can also kind of internalize some biases much younger than we may think, like by ages like two or four. So I think that that young age, it's really important to, you know, one, for children of color to be able to foster an environment in which they see themselves in a very uh, positive light. You know, there's lots of studies that have been done in the past that kind of talk about, you know, whether it's like mainstream impressions of, of beauty or nobility or good and mainstream impressions of, you know, the opposite of not beauty, of, of being bad. And I think that in many ways, children have internalized that. So I think it's really important uh, at a very young age to kind of promote a very positive sense of oneself and value of oneself. And it's really important at a young age to kind of recognize the difference in a positive light and, and not to kind of ingrain those racial biases uh, in children at that kind of developmentally important stage. Uh, And I think there's, you know, lots of books and videos about, you know, highlighting positive difference between children uh, and races. The website Common Sense Media has a lot of information about that. Uh, There's a website called The Brown Bookshelf that have like protagonists who are black and brown to kind of highlight the positive things that could come from differences. And I think as kids get older, it's important to kind of check in with them and help them you know, number one, what is their awareness of the differences between people? What is their awareness of of what's going on right now? And how are they coping with it? Um, How are they internalizing it? And I think how you respond as a parent is is, is very much dependent on, you know, the developmental point that your child is at and what their understanding is. And then also, I think being aware where you're at as a parent. You know, I know for me, I've been really upset and kind of agitated about all of this lately. And, and, you know, maybe if you're feeling that way, it's it's not the best time to kind of talk to your child about this. If you're not able to kind of direct the conversation in a, in a way that benefits uh, your child and, and yourself really. I think that's really helpful. You know, a couple parents have reached out to us on social media and other places after this saying, you know, I was always told like I never really brought up race with my kids because I wanted to raise like a colorblind child. So like saying that, like you wouldn't point out the differences between their young friends. Right. Because at they're like at this age, they're all playing together. And, and I always thought to just to ignore it. But it seems like the the tide is turning Um, And that there can, even at the younger ages, be conversations about race um, in a positive way. And and so that whole like colorblind is 
is not really helpful because really in the end it ends up kind of propagating the problem. Yeah, I think that's a great point that goes back to structural racism. Uh, I think structural racism in and of itself doesn't necessarily require, you know, a racist individual to propagate it. You know, it's structural. It's kind of always there. And teaching kids from a very young age um, about positive differences between races and ethnicities and helping them to appreciate that and think of it in a positive light is really a, a way, I think, that we dismantle racism and we develop a society that is um, anti-racist because um, it's, you know, I think the tide is now, like you said, not enough to not be racist, but what are we doing to address the structural and institutional racism that it, that is so prevalent in our society? So we've talked about how pediatricians are getting more involved sort of both in the exam room and out of the exam room. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how we can kind of promote equitable care for all children. And then uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about policies and um, how more systemic policies might help to change the tide. I think that's a great and very difficult question because I think as we talked about over the course of this conversation, you know, structural racism is kind of almost baked into the cake of our society and it's so pervasive and its impacts are so pervasive. And I think that in a lot of ways, our education and training is like focusing on providing care for a patient um, that is in our clinic and in front of us right now. And I think it's, you know, really clear, especially for uh, those of us who practice in marginalized communities, uh, especially marginalized communities of color, uh, that we often can feel like helpless, like we can't really address the needs um, of our patient. So I think in promoting um, that kind of idea of equity uh, and addressing these issues, to me, the really the most important thing is to kind of engage young people and engage our patients and families about their lived experiences uh, because they're the real experts of them and, and understanding from them, you know, what is it that are the strengths, number one, of your community? What is it that are the strengths of your child? How do we make your strengths stronger? How do we accentuate those? But also, what are the injustices? What are the gaps that are needed? Um, what are the gaps that need to be filled in, in your community? And how can we, um, as physicians, or as anybody really who's passionate about these issues, how can we come together, advocate, and support uh, these communities uh, in having some more kind of agency in what's going on and having a more equitable allocation of resources to address their needs. That makes perfect sense. So it's getting to know your community, the community that you live in, and sort of taking, I mean, either asking them when you're in the office or taking a step out into the community and, you know, volunteering or being the, the you know, team doctor on the, the football team or you know, getting to know the community that way. Yeah, knowing, you know, what the community looks like, it, you know, you can drive around some communities and not see grocery stores, not see green spaces, um, not see walkable neighborhoods. And then you go to clinic and you see that most of your children are obese. And then it's a, not a surprise. You know, the community infrastructure is kind of built for that to occur, which is a great example of structural racism. So I think working with those communities and working with, you know, our legislators and our policymakers and our community organizations to address those structural issues. But also I think as physicians, it's really important, you know, to highlight those who are in the community, those who both live in the community, who are working in the community um, and support them. And we don't necessarily have to bring them the answers and bring them the solutions. Oftentimes, you know, they will tell us the answers and the solution, and it's about empowering and supporting um, and listening um, to, to what they say that they need. We did talk a little bit about policies um, and that there seems to be sort of a shift this time for more discussion about policy change, both with police violence 
um, as well as other um, structural racism. Um, are there any specific policies that you feel are are really beneficial? There is some literature now or some studies now that are talking about um, some policies. So, you know, one is if you go to 8cantwait.org, they talk about some immediate recommendations that police departments can and cities can implement right away um, that would likely decrease uh, police violence. So some of those things are, you know, banning chokeholds and strangleholds or requiring de-escalation or requiring um, warnings before shooting. And I think, I think those are things that can be done immediately. And then there's bigger structural issues that are likely more important or more impactful that I think we really need to talk about as a society. Many people on social media may have seen like the hashtag or the phrase defund the police. Um, but the question is really about the amount of resources we're putting into our police forces uh, versus the amount of resources we're putting into our social services and kind of rethinking, does it make sense to change what that funding looks like uh, to more adequately address the social determinants of health and, and change that? Me personally, I think I'm an, an advocate for the kind of approach where we really kind of take a a look at how we're allocating our resources in our society and making sure that we're investing in the social determinants of health and making sure that we're investing to kind of create a community where all children, regardless of what color they are or where they come from, have an equitable chance to reach their full potential. And so just to clarify, part of the defund the police is it's shifting funds, Correct. So it's saying that, for example, if somebody's having a mental health emergency, are the police the best people to respond to that? Or should we have a mental health professional? Should we equip mental health professionals in the community to respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think mental health is a great example. And there's, you know, if, if you look into that kind of conversation, there's lots of other examples of how we could maybe strategically invest in services and in communities to, to kind of get to address really the root causes of, you know, um, violence and other kind of delinquent behaviors that we see among, you know, adolescents and adults. So I was just wondering, we talked a bit about talking with children and about celebrating some differences and strengths. What about talking with um, parents um, of white children? Is there something that they can do to make their kids more sensitive to racism? Is it the same sort of strategy? I think we have to remember that children are always listening, especially, you know, when they're younger. And I think there's a lot of um, maybe households or a lot of places where, you know, there may be some, you know, racist comments or some stereotypical comments um, that are made or television shows that are watched that kind of don't portray things in a, in a certain light. So I think it's really important for us to kind of remember that we have to, you know, model the behavior um, that we're looking for and how easily it is to for kids to kind of internalize these things. I mean, if we think about you know, from birth to three, just how much almost passively language a child develops. You know, the same way they internalize those words, they can internalize some of those kind of racist or stereotypical attitudes. And it's the same thing like with the media, just being mindful of, of, of what they're seeing and, and what they're watching and checking in. And then also I think it's, it's important for children of color, but also for for white children to hear it too, to kind of celebrate our differences and kind of ingrain in them at that young age that, you know, our differences are not a bad thing. Uh, they're, they're a strength. We talked about how social media has changed things and have, um, you know, some of the ups and downs, like you don't always want to have your phone out to record, but that it's also been 
you know, very impactful and horrifying to see some of these videos. Um, And we know that specifically our teenagers are on social media all the time. And so I think as a parent, you know, I, that they're going to be watching these videos. Um, How do you talk to teens about this? How do you make sure that, that they're kind of understanding what's happening and processing it appropriately? So I think with, with teens, it can be tricky. I, I think oftentimes um, parents kind of think, you know, their teens are not. Sometimes parents kind of assume or think that their teens don't have an idea of what's going on or, or may not be as aware because they're not watching the news. But um, I think they, they very much are aware and, and they actually feel it in, I think, in a much more visceral way through their social media networks as opposed through on the news I mean, we've all seen very like heart wrenching and traumatizing videos of of people in in distress. Um, so I think with with teens and preteens, kind of checking in with them to ask them um, what they've seen online, what they've heard, asking them what they think about it, um, if it's upsetting to them, um, why or why not, um, and kind of starting a conversation with them about kind of how they see the world and understanding that and building off of that. I think it's really easy uh, for adults to kind of preach down or talk down to teenagers. uh, And that is a way to uh, really alienate them. So I think kind of understanding and meeting them uh, where they are and facilitating a conversation with them about what they would like to see different in the world and what their role is in in achieving that. I mean, I think teens have uh, an incredible um, potential. And I think to a large degree, they're the ones out here, you know, really driving the conversation and, and, and driving change and are participating in, in a way that's really, really powerful. So, you know, I know it's a instincts of parents to, to protect them, but at the same time, it's also uh, supporting them, uh, supporting their strengths and kind of highlighting uh, the incredible work that teenagers all around the country have been doing. So I think that we have covered a lot of ground in our discussion. We really tried to help define systemic racism and why it is such an issue, as well as individual racism, how we can talk to kids and teens about these difficult topics and what we can do as individuals, as well as some more systemic policies to help improve this. It's not something that when the protests die down or when the social media posts go away is going anywhere. So it's just uh, important to keep this at the forefront and um, keep the conversation going. And Dr. Owens, thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. And we look forward to continuing to try and make at least our institution a better place. That wraps up this episode of Kids Considered. You can find more information on our website, kidsconsidered.ucdavis.edu. Follow us on Twitter at Kids Considered. And Instagram at Kids Considered. If you have feedback on this show or topics you would like us to discuss in the future, we would love to hear from you. Please call us. Our number is 916-915-3388. Or email us at kidsconsidered at gmail.com. Please rate us on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to your podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we hope you will join us for our next podcast. Kids Considered is sponsored by UC Davis Children's Hospital.